Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Boost Your Biology podcast. Today's epic guest is a bodybuilding champion, author, personal trainer, and motivational speaker. He's an expert on muscular development and biomechanics, has won numerous prestigious bodybuilding titles during his competitive career, including Mr. California, Mr. America, and Mr. Universe. Doug Brignoli, welcome to the show, man. Thank you very much, Lucas. It's great to be here. Awesome. So, Doug, do you want to let my listeners know a little bit about your story, how you got so fascinated into sort of biomechanics? Uh, okay. Well, I started working out when I was uh, 14, 15 years old, and um, I've always been very curious about um, what, what determines what is better than what when it comes to resistance exercise. So, um, and, and by the way, I, I think that everyone should be this curious. Everyone should be this inquisitive, right? So rather than just saying, okay, well, here's six different tricep exercises, everyone should be asking, well, what is the difference between one and the other? Which one is better? Which one is worse? They can't all be equal, right? So we know the tricep extends the elbow. We can start with that, right? So we know the more you extend it, the more range of motion, the better. But some are heavier at the beginning and easier at the end, and some are easier at the beginning and heavier at the end, right? So we should ask, well, is one of those better than the other? Well, the answer is yes. One is actually better than the other, mm -hmm. right? So I started kind of like experimenting with this stuff when I was a kid, not even knowing the word biomechanics, <laughs> not even knowing that what I was actually doing was, was manipulating physics, so, for example, I was 15 years old at Bill Pearl's gym, and I was doing wrist curls, barbell wrist curls, with my hands on the top of my legs, on sitting on a flat bench. And as I was doing this, I sensed that I was getting more stretch at the bottom than was comfortable. But when I got to the top, it kind of went up and over the top. It got too easy at the top. Well, what I was experiencing was that this resistance curve was it matching my strength curve? Mm. And yet if I pop, if I prop up the end of that bench so that my forms aren't actually horizontal, but they're actually like this, now I'm doing it like this. Well, guess what? It gets easier at the bottom and a little harder at the top. I was 15 years old. I was manipulating the resistance curve. Mm. That's just one out of several examples, but I started trying to figure out what was better than what. Um, but there was no reference book. Hmm. Now, if you wanted to figure out what makes a, a, a plane more flight worthy than another airplane, you would get the principles of aviation. You would realize these are ratios. These are, you know, if you have a plane that weighs this much, the wingspan has to be this, the wing thickness has to be this, the wing tilt has to be this, you know, you have to, the propulsion has to be this. I mean, there's, you know, physics requirements. And likewise with the body, this is basically a crane. That's what this is. It's a crane, right? These are things that lift things just like cranes lift things, right? If you were an engineer and your job was to design a crane, you wouldn't know how to design it better or worse based on better being, right? The ability to lift a heavier weight, hmm. right? But when we're talking about resistance exercise, the objective isn't to lift a heavier weight. The objective is to load the muscle more. Right. So certain physics magnifies the resistance more to muscles and other physics, or I should say the same physics, but going the other direction, minimizes it. Right. So the reason why we like, let's say, squat, barbell squats is because the resistance is actually minimized to the participating muscles, which allows you to therefore squat a lot of weight. Mm. Right. But instead of using an exercise that minimizes the resistance, and forces you to use a heavier weight, which then loads your skeleton and strains your skeleton, the wiser approach is to say, I can get twice as much load with half as much weight, and I can get as much muscle stimulation or more, but without you know straining my back and my spine and my shoulders and my skeleton, et cetera. You know what I really like about that, Doug, is you know that inquisitive nature, just wanting to understand the body bit better and then apply movements to cater for its needs. So I'd love to, I'd love to explore that sort of trade-off between how can we load muscles without causing a, you know, detrimental effect on our skeletal um, structure. 
Well, um, the first thing that, that has to be acknowledged is that um, human nature or male nature being what it is, right? Macho nature being what it is. We have equated how much you lift with how much you load a muscle. So we've conflated the two. And, 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 and we've become, you know, we've been sort of brainwashed by this whole beast mode thing, right? Without actually understanding that how much load a muscle gets is not only related to how much you're lifting. Hmm. It's related to how much you're lifting as influenced by the length of the levers and the angles of those levers relative to the direction of resistance. Now, this is where it gets a little bit heady. This is where it gets a little complicated. And, and this is where some people have a hard time understanding it. So in my book, I try to make it very clear that if you're dealing with, let's say, free weight, you're doing, let's say, curls, that barbell is being pulled straight down by gravity no matter where it is in the range of motion. If you were to draw a straight arrow down as that thing moves through that curve, you would know, even though gravity is invisible, you would know exactly the angle of that forearm relative to that straight down angle of the on the dumbbell, right? But when you're dealing with cables, now it's a different direction of resistance. Mm. And when you're dealing with other things like, let's say, friction force, friction force has to do with you, let's say, changing the direction that you're actually pushing because now you've added another element. It's not simply free weight. So you know that you do a squat with a Swiss ball against the wall. You put the ball against the wall. You put your back against the ball. Your feet are at an angle. Okay, well, if you put oil on the ground, assuming you've got, let's say, a, just a concrete slab, your feet would slide forward. They wouldn't slide forward if you were just standing with a regular barbell squat. Because with a barbell squat, you're pushing straight down, right? So then you have to, you, you, your, your direction of force is straight up, right? But when you're pushing from an angle, now you're actually changing the direction of your effort. And that's called friction force. It could also be called um, uh, ground reaction force. It's the same basic thing. But I'll give you a more, uh, uh, an easier thing to understand. Let's just say you're going to compare a, a flat dumbbell press to a flat bench press. Because you've got free weights, dumbbells, that they're independent, right? These dumbbells, now your nature, the force you exert will be pulling toward the middle line of the body, right? So... If you're doing a barbell, you can't pull toward the middle line of the body because your hands are attached to the bar. Mm. So you're actually not even pulling toward the center. You're actually pushing linearly to the outside because you have to. It's, and that's why we use chalk on our hands to keep our hands from sliding out. If you put oil on your hands, your hands would slide out, which means you're actually activating the tricep with a bench press, but you're not activating the triceps if you're pulling toward the center. Mm. So that's where it starts getting a little complicated for people. And I try to, in my book, you know, I have arrows and I have like lines and I explain, you know, where the direction of resistance or the direction of your effort changed. Mm. Right. So how that influences what gets loaded more, what gets loaded less. But if we're going to spend a lot of time in the gym, if you're going to spend a lot of effort in the gym um, and you're trying to get the best gains without injury, it would be super wise to just learn how this stuff works because you can get much more bang for the buck. You can save yourself wasted effort. You can save yourself injury if you just understand some of these principles. Mm. That friction, um, friction force that you mentioned, um, something that came to my mind, Doug, is, is actually in my backyard. I've got a, I've got a chin-up station set up, but it's one of those ones that's it's not just a bar hanging from – uh, you know, a, a wall. It's actually one of those machine ones where it's actually a bit wobbly when I actually try and do the chin-ups. I'm thinking these chin-ups, I'm wondering if I'm losing a lot. It's actually the whole machine's wobbly. I'm wondering if I'm losing a bit of, you know, is something, what's happening there? Well, um, there's another factor here and that is the factor of stability, mm. right? So that's talked about in my book too, where we, we say, okay, so if I add an element of instability to an exercise, what does it do? What does it do and what does it compromise? 
Mm. Right. So we see there's a trend now. The trend is to add instability. So you see a lot of people in the gyms doing curls on one leg. Right. Or you see people doing, let's say, overhead presses while standing on a wobble board or standing on a sponge. Mm. Right. And so um, one of the things that we have to recognize is that the fitness industry being as commercially driven as it is, like all commercially driven industries, there is a lot of misinformation that's put out there because people are trying to get you to buy something by be- getting you to believe that you will benefit from something that probably will not benefit you. <laughs> so that's what happens with instability is it's, it is, it is unfortunately sold to trainers by the powers that be, by the, the, the trainer industry that makes money on trainers. Hmm. We're hoping to make train money on clients, right? So the industry fools the trainer into thinking that instability will benefit the client. The client likes it because that makes him believe or her believe that he can create uh, the impression of, 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 of knowledge and expertise to the client that makes him seem or her seem more valuable, right? But what happens typically is you say, okay, so... It's being sold to people with this idea that it'll help your balance. In fact, I got a cute story I'll tell you in just a second if we have the time for it. But um, it's, it's a cute story about how a, a guy who's out of shape, he's you know 40 years old, he hasn't worked out since high school, he's finally got the confidence to go to the gym, and he's, he, he's lying on the flat bench and he's doing a, you know, a set of these, that's what he remembers. And the trainer sees, the trainer's looking for work, right, looking for clients, See someone who looks a little unsure. He says, hey, can I show you a better way to do that? And the guy goes, God, thank you so much. I'd love it. He takes him over to the Swiss ball. He puts him on the Swiss ball. It's a little bit bouncy. He's got the same, let's say, 30-pound dumbbells. Okay, he can manage it, right? And he says, no, that's not what I want you to do. What I want you to do is I want you to one foot down and one foot up. Well, before he was a tripod, and now he's a bipod. So now he's obviously less stable, but he realizes that as long as I keep these dumbbells Equally distant from the center, I can manage it just like a tightrope walker with one of those long poles, right? It turns out that's not what I want you to do. What I want you to do is I want you to leave one up, bring the other one down. But as soon as he does that, he falls to the weighted side. And the trainer goes, looks like we've got a problem. In other words, this guy thinks he came in here to just lose some fat and gain some muscle and feel good. And the trainer now has misled him into thinking that his, his balance is somehow in need of repair. Mm. Well, no, this is just physics. This is exactly what happens. So he's got this guy, first of all, going from 30 pound dumbbells to maybe 20 pound dumbbells. And then he brings it closer to the center because the wider he brings it, the more it magnifies that 20 pounds. And so he's he's drastically reduced the load to his pecs. Mm. If he was smart enough to ask, it seems like my pecs are being less loaded now. What's the trade-off? The trainer goes, the core, you're working your core now, which is this really ambiguous term that no one really seems to explain very well. The core is actually four or five muscles that basically pull your torso forward, pull your torso back, bend your torso, and rotate your torso. Those are the core muscles, right? There's, they're the very specific. And so it, while it's somewhat true that by doing this, you have to sort of do a torso rotation to keep it from falling, the instability of that exercise will prohibit you from using as much resistance on torso rotation as you'd be able to get with a cable. Mm -hmm. So you're compromising both. The instability compromises both. And you're playing this little charade with this client who thinks they're, they're improving their balance when all they're really doing is learning a skill that will only benefit you during this particular exercise and nothing more. Right. Fascinating. Fascinating. Love it. So Doug, I'd love to, I'd love to dive deeper into the shoulder press. Um, I, I know you've spoken quite a lot around this. So yeah. Do you want to explain the, you know, the physics around the shoulder press itself? Okay. So when we're talking about shoulders, we know there's side deltoid, we know there's front deltoid, we know there's rear deltoid. And the, the thing that is always important to ask ourselves is what is the most basic thing that muscle does? Okay. Well, the most basic thing all muscles do is it the muscle will cause the insertion to pull its limb towards the origin. Okay, so this is the insertion. Here's the origin. When that, when that thing 
shortens, it just raises the arm. That is the purest thing the side deltoid does, period. The front deltoid moves it to the front. The rear deltoid moves it to the back, okay? So when you look at an overhead press, the first thing you should notice is that doesn't look anything like those three movements I just showed you, right? So right away, you know that whatever it is you're doing that involves the side deltoid and the front deltoid isn't quite as pure as it could be, okay, number one. Number two is from an evolutionary standpoint, and one of my endorsers is an evolutionary biologist, a paleoanthrop paleoanthropologist. So he, he says, basically, I'm a forensic scientist. Basically, I look at the skeleton and I look at, you know, what that skeleton was designed to do based on prehistoric man's needs, right? Well, we know that prehistoric man never had to move a heavy object vertically overhead. Yes, he had to climb trees, right? But pulling down is a lot different than pushing up yeah. because pulling down pulls the scapula up and out, right? Like when you're doing a lot, you can see the scapula flare, right? But when you're, when, you're, when you're pushing up, the scapula can't go up, right? So that means that the scapula is basically staying down and there's, there's a part of the scapula that's called the acromion process. It's, got, it's like a little awning. Right. And so the upper arm bone goes up underneath it. And when you push beyond right about here, the whole scapula has to shift up in order to allow that. And whatever's in between there gets squeezed. And when you do it occasionally, it's no big deal. What gets squeezed is the supraspinatus tendon and the subacromial bursa. So, you know, we are designed to occasionally put things on a shelf. But when you do it heavy and you do it repeatedly, then those tissues start getting inflamed or they rupture. And so that's called impingement syndrome. Mm. Separate from that, um, there is a, a physics principle that says that, that for example, if I do this, this is a sledge, you know, a hammer. As long as this thing stays perfectly vertical, I can balance it. As soon as it starts to lean in one direction, I can't balance it anymore. I have to grab it, right, and, and pull it back to center. Well, um, in order to do an overhead press, the least, I guess, well, the least injurious way is to have that forearm be completely vertical. If it starts to lean forward, it'll want to keep falling forward, right? And so then I have to use a different muscle called the infraspinatus to basically reverse arm wrestle, to externally rotate my humerus to prevent this thing from falling farther forward, okay? Most people, more than 50% of the population, don't have enough mobility in their shoulder joint to sufficiently externally rotate their arm to make this go neutral. So if you're in the gym and you're looking around and you're watching people do either barbell or dumbbell overhead presses, you'll notice they're doing this. Right, they're not able to keep their form vertical, and that means that they're straining the infraspinatus, and the infraspinatus is not the goal of the exercise. It's side deltoid, right? So now you've got excessive external rotation of the humerus plus loading of the infraspinatus plus impingement because you're pushing up underneath the supraspinatus tendon and the and the, and the subacromial bursa, and then what happens is this. So. Imagine that this is your arm right here, right? And so this is your elbow, right? And this is your side deltoid, right? So theoretically, the side deltoid would move the arm up like that. So watch what happens when you bend your arm. You see where the deltoid is, right? Yep. When you rotate the arm, when you rotate the arm, first you raise it and then you go like this. So look at it from here. You raise the arm and you rotate it. Yep. So you can see the side delta is now rotated to the rear, hmm. right? It used to be on top, and there's a thing in physics called the line of force, uh, or you could call it, I call it opposite position loading. Whatever muscle is directly opposite the direction of gravity or the direction of the resistance will be the muscle that's most loaded, whether that's your intention or not. <laughs> so if your objective is to maximally load a muscle, one of the first things you need to do is make sure that your target muscle is directly opposite 
the direction of resistance. So if gravity pulls at six o'clock, your muscle has to be at 12 o'clock. Right. So, right? Directly opposite. Yeah. But now you've taken this muscle and you've rotated it to the three o'clock or the nine o'clock position. Mm. Or maybe the two o'clock or 10 o'clock position. But it is not in a position. Here's, here's the line. Here's the, so you go like this. You've now moved the side deltoid away from the opposing force. Mm. You're still getting a little bit of it. You're still getting about 40% of the downward force, but you're not getting the 100% that it was getting when it was completely opposite gravity. Mm. Now you've, you've shifted your front deltoid more to the 12 o'clock position. And so the front deltoid, in fact, is more loaded during an overhead press than the side deltoid. Now you might say, oh, that's okay because I want to work my front deltoid. And I would say, yes, I do too. But there's a better, more, more effective, more productive and safer way to work the front deltoid than the overhead press. Right. So it, what's important to understand is when we're talking about biomechanics, we're talking about degrees of good and degrees of bad. Right. So people try to pin me down. They go, Doug Brignoli says overhead presses are bad. I say, no, I don't say that. I say they're compromised. They have reduced percentage of loading. It requires more weight to load the, the muscles as compared to a longer lever, a longer straighter arm, right? Mm. And you're straining the joint. So do they build shoulders? Yeah, they do build shoulders, right? <laughs> but they do it in the most costly way. Mm. Amazing, amazing. And um, that whole premise around like it's understanding the person's goal, what it, what muscle group do they want to target and then selecting the best exercise for that particular muscle group. So that, that makes sense. You're sort of saying that shoulder press is going to activate more of that front delt um, and the triceps and less so the actual um, the side deltoid. Yeah. But but the, the problem also, and this is a sociological issue, Right. The sociological issue is that we've been involved in this field that's about 100 years old now, and there's been a lot of dogma that's been laid down over the years, right? So this whole idea of compound exercises being king um, is not necessarily correct. And the reason I say that, and listen carefully, people, because I don't want the words to be taken out of context. When you're doing a compound exercise, Multiple muscles are working as participants in that exercise. Each muscle is doing its job and its job only. It doesn't know or care what other muscles are doing their job. They're moving other joints, right? So the question we have to ask ourselves is, is each participating muscle doing the best, getting the most benefit from that exercise as compared to how that muscle would benefit from an exercise that was working only it. <laughs> now, the way I explain this so people can sort of understand this, imagine 10 guys carrying a log down the street. Okay? The first thing we have to ask ourselves is, not every guy is probably pushing the same, you know, putting out the same amount of effort. Some guys could be sandbagging. <laughs> Some guys are ambitious and they're doing more than their fair share. Right? At the same time, each guy has a different strength capacity. So one guy might be working at 100% of his lesser capacity. And then a guy, another guy could be working at 70% of his maximum capacity because he has more capacity. Right? So when you're doing parallel bar dips, as an example, the muscle that gets most loaded is the front delta because it has the least capacity. In addition to it having the least capacity, the physics of the movement also loads that muscle the most. And yet most people... Don't do parallel bar dips for front deltoids. They do it for chest or they do it for triceps. So we have to look at the mechanics of chest exercises or of the pectoralis and the mechanics of the tricep and evaluate them individually and say, how does that compare with a dedicated tricep exercise and a dedicated chest exercise? And stop worrying about the fact that you can move more weight with a compound exercise, well, we should be, well, I shouldn't say what we should be worried about because everybody's got their own philosophy. But what is the wisest approach if your objective is to build size and strength? And I'm going to say strength too, right? It's not just cosmetic. It's not just for bodybuilders. 
a muscle that is more loaded has more stimulus for strength. Yep. Even if the weight that's moving that lesser weight, even, if, even, even though you're lifting a lesser weight, what matters is how much load that muscle is getting. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. I'd love to, I'd love to dive into, um, you talk quite a lot around the sissy squat. Um, so do you want to explain the differences in sort of quad activation between a, a sissy squat versus a standard squat? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, let's start off with this basic premise of, of a pendulum, right? So let's just say you have, you have a pendulum from a, hanging from a clock, right? As long as this lever is vertical, and again, I'm talking vertical when we're dealing with free weight, right? So if you're dealing with, let's say, you know, one of those sissy squat benches, you've changed the mechanics. That's no longer free weight because now you're changing your direction of push, right? So if this is just hanging straight down, it's, it's neutral when it's vertical. If you were to move it over to a side, it's going to want to come back down again with a certain amount of force. If you were to measure this force right here, when it's at a 45 degree angle, what you would discover is that it's less force, less downward force than it would be if he was here. Right? If you put a scale under it right here, you would find more downward force than here. Right? And then if you kept going, again, it's going to be the same. A 45 degree angle above horizontal is the same as a 45 degree angle below horizontal. And that's because of this thing called the moment arm. And the moment arm is, oops, the moment arm is the distance. The moment arm is the distance between here and wherever the weight is measured with vertical lines. Vertical lines because, the degree, because gravity is pulling vertically. Okay? So if you were to shorten this, This moment arm is shorter than this moment arm. That means you're going to get more magnification here than here. You'd have to use twice as much weight here to balance out half as much weight here because of this moment arm. But the moment arm also has to do with angles, right? It isn't just the length of the lever. It's also the angle. So, for example, let's do this. Okay, so here's, can you see that? Yep. All right. So here we've got this angle, and I've got one of these bolts. These are about four ounces each. Okay, and you can see these, these, these things are even, right? Now I'm going to take one of these and put it over here. So now I've got two over here and one over here. So before I did that, it's safe to say this. One weight with a lever at this angle. And this length is equal to one weight at a lever the same angle and the same length. Right. But if I add a second one here, I have a different ratio. Two weights with a lever that's six inches long and at this angle is equal to one weight with a lever that's six inches long at that angle. Right. Okay, I'm going to add a third one. Now I've got three weights. I don't know if you can see it here. Let me just do this. Right? I've got three weights, which is equal to one weight here with a lever that's six inches long at a 30 degree angle, six inch lever, horizontal angle. Why? Because of this, of this moment arm. Right. Right? So when you're doing a squat, your lower leg, which is the lever that's being operated by the quadricep, is tilting forward at that 30 degree angle. Right. And when you're doing a sissy squat, your lower leg goes to the horizontal angle. Mm. You get what I'm saying? In other words, you need three times more weight in order to match what the lower leg would do when it's horizontal. Right. So we're talking about magnification of load. You get less, much less magnification of load when your lower leg is only at 30 degrees then when it's horizontal. So we can actually calculate math. We can do the numbers. We can see if you weigh 200 pounds and you put a 200 pound barbell on your back, that's 400 pounds. You have two legs. So 
each leg gets 200 pounds of resistance, not accounting for the fact that, you know, we're adding in the lower leg weight. So the lower leg is about 16 inches. I think I did the math on it. 16 inches, a 16 to one ratio ratio. So you say 200 pounds times 16 times 30%. That gives you about 950 pounds of load per quadricep. Respectable amount. Mm. Okay. If you weigh 200 pounds, just like the other person who was doing the squat, and you do a sissy squat with no additional weight, and you let your lower leg go all the way to horizontal, you can do the same math. 200 pounds divided in half is 100 pounds times 16 times 100% instead of 30%. And that adds up to 1,200 and some pounds. So which would you rather have? Would you rather have 1,200 pounds of quadricep load or 950 pounds of quadricep load? That alone, never mind the energy costs, never mind the spinal compression, never mind another thing that I'll tell you about in just a second here. Just on the face, just on the physics face of it, you get more load with a sissy squat on the quadricep than you do with a 200-pound barbell squat. Now, I admit, and everyone should acknowledge this, when you're doing the sissy squat, you're getting zero glutes. But when you're doing a barbell squat, you're getting glutes. You're not getting as much glutes as you would with an isolated glute exercise. And we can do the same math on that. But you are getting more quadricep load, and you're not jeopardizing your spine in the process. Mm. So if you did a sissy squat for the quads and you did, let's say a multi-hip machine, which we could explain later, but if you did a dedicated glute exercise, you can get more glute loading, more quad loading, and neither of those two exercises load your spine. <laughs> you can get more with less. Mm. Right now, again, as I said before, the quads don't know what you're doing in order to load them. The glutes don't know what you're doing. All they know about is how much load you're giving them. And they're going to respond, respond specifically to how much load they're getting. The more load, the better. Mm. Assuming it has the capacity to deal with it. Now, there's one little factor here that's less important, but still important. And that is whenever you do a compound movement, sometimes muscles that, um, uh, sometimes muscles that um, work in opposite directions have to participate. Okay. <laughs> there's a thing called Lombard's paradox. And, and there was a guy named uh, Lombard in 1903 who was, he was a physiologist. And he said, well, you know, the hamstrings participate in hip extension, right? So that means when a person is squatting, their hamstrings are activated. But if the hamstrings are activated, they would automatically bend the knee because muscle contraction is muscle contraction. If muscle shortens, it pulls the two ends together yep. and the hamstring contraction would automatically cause the, the knee to bend. And yet somehow the knee, the knee is extending. In other words, he was thinking, shouldn't squats be impossible? Wouldn't it happen that the hamstring and the quadricep are pulling that lower leg in opposite directions? The quadricep is trying to extend it and the hamstring is trying to bend it and they would cancel each other out. He, that's why he called it paradox. He was mystified. Three years later, a guy named Sherrington came along and understood that there's a neurological factor that we have called reciprocal innervation. Yes. And reciprocal innervation means that the, 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 the central nervous system knows that there's an inherent conflict of interest happening in this particular activity. Wow. And it selectively sends a relaxation synapse to the less vital muscle. And that is the hamstring. Why is it less vital? Because the hip can be extended with the gluteus, oh. assisted by the adductor. It doesn't need the hamstring to hip extend. It can do it without the hamstring. But the quadricep, excuse me, but the knee has to rely on the, on the quadricep for extension. Mm. You cannot shut off the quadricep and get any extension. So quadricep activation triggers the central nervous system to deactivate mm. the hamstring in order to allow knee extension to occur. So that means that when you're activating your hip extension, not only is the hamstring shutting off, but so is the rectus femoris, which is one of your four quadricep muscles, because that muscle is the only one that has a double function. The other three parts of the quadricep 
only extend the knee. They only cross the hip joint. But the rectus femoris also crosses the hip joint. And so it has a secondary function of hip flexion, right. which is the opposite of hip extension. And one has to be shut off and it can't be the glutes. So it shuts off the rectus femoris. That means you're getting deactivation of one quarter of your quadricep when you're squatting. Right. Precisely when you're trying to build your quadriceps. In addition to those mechanical things, those physics things I just pointed out, you need three times more weight to load the quadricep because of the angle of the lower leg. And you're also getting this neurological conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. So when people say, is it a good exercise? They go, well, it's not an efficient exercise. And they go, well, but people have built big quads with, with squats. I say, I don't doubt they have. But it's like it's the taking the roughest, rockiest, muddiest road to get there. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's brilliant. That's brilliant, Doug. Um, there is another sort of concept I'd love to discuss with you and that's around the whole like time under tension versus eccentric, um, loading. Like let's unpack those terms. My listeners explain what that even refers to. Okay. Let me first, um, say that now you're touching on something that crosses over into muscle physiology. Everything we just talked about before that was biomechanics, mm. okay? And this is important to note because sometimes you'll get an exercise physiologist who will cross over and start giving information about biomechanics that's not correct because muscle physiology is its own science. Mm. One of my endorsers is a guy named Wayne Westcott, PhD, one of the most renowned exercise professors in the country. And he said to me, Doug, we really spent very, very, when I got my PhD, we spent very little time talking about physics and mechanics. Well, likewise, you know, people like me who are biomechanics specialists, if we're sincere about what we're saying, and I am, we say, okay, I'm crossing over into a realm that's less my expertise. For this, I defer to people like Brad Schoenfeld and Chris Beardsley. This is their realm of expertise. However, I do read their articles so I can touch on it to the best of my ability, but I cannot speak with the same degree of authority sure. that I can on things having to do with mechanics. Sure. Um, what I will say is this, is time under tension is very closely linked with this idea of uh, number of, of, of productive reps. Okay, so... Um, which kind of has to do with fatigue. And this is where it gets really hard to understand. Let me start off by saying that there was a study that was done that showed that you can get an equal amount of muscle growth with a set of high reps, low weight taken to failure versus one set of heavy weight, heavy enough to, let's say, limit you to six reps, not taken to failure. Okay, so if the weight is heavy enough, meaning it's about 80% or more of your, of your maximum capacity, if you want rep max, every single rep, in, including the very first rep, calls into, uh, into action maximum recruitment of muscle fibers. But the high, the high rep, low weight set doesn't call high recruitment until the very end, until it's so, so, so exhausted that it calls out all the troops. Come on, everybody, we need some help here. You know, we're going to fail here pretty soon, right? So you get high recruitment with exhaustive fatigue, or you get high recruitment with a heavy percentage of weight relative to your maximum capacity, okay? So when they did the study, they did one set of this and one set of that, and they go, oh, you can get muscle growth either way. Okay, what if I'm not happy with the amount of muscle growth I got with just one set? Can I, how many more sets can I do like this versus how many more sets can I do like that? I can do a lot more sets like that, especially if I stay away from failure. If I take it to, let's say, 95, 96% maximum capacity and I stay away from total failure, I can do six, seven sets of those. But over here, I've got so much lactic acid. I've got so much systemic fatigue. I probably have some cortisol production. So not only here can you not do very many more sets like that, 
but you also have more recovery time now because you've got more things to recover from. Mm -hmm. So you can get more muscle growth doing more sets with heavier weight of lower reps. So how does this tie in with what you said? Time under tension is really not so much time as much as it is the number of reps that qualify, right? So you can get more qualified reps. You can get more time under tension. Those, those types of reps that call into action high recruitment of fibers mm. than you can by trying to do it with. So when people say, well, Brignoli talks about doing high reps, it's like, ah, look, there was a time when I was writing for Ironman magazine when Steve Holman asked me what I was experimenting with. And so I said, I'm experimenting with 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. <laughs> right. So he said, hey, I love it because back then, they were talking about this theory of, of, uh, of uh, what do they call it, um, sarcoplasmic growth. Yeah. They thought that the sarcoplasm, which is this fuel tank around the muscle fiber, if sufficiently exhausted, would compensate by storing more fuel and adding to the volume size of the muscle. Turns out it's actually not that way, and we didn't know that yet, but that's the reason why Steve Holman thought that it was a good way to train. Hmm. The first thing I would say about that is 50 reps – doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to failure. You can do 50 reps with a weight that's very, very light just to get the blood going, right? So I can do a set of 50 reps and still not cross beyond 60% maximum effort, right? I'm just warming things up. Then I go a little heavier, 40, a little bit higher percentage of effort, add a little weight, a little higher percentage. A little high. So when I was talking 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, I was talking about the 10 rep set being 100% effort, right? The 15 rep set being, you know, 90%, 80%, 70%, 60%. So I, I'm not suggesting that high rep training is the better way to grow muscle. But mm -hmm. I am suggesting that it's one way if you've got short time to yes. try to get the maximum amount of work to the muscle in the shortest amount of time. If you've got more time, I would say don't do five sets, do 10 sets. Yeah. Start with 30 reps, go to 20, 15, 10, 8, 6, 6, 6. <laughs> That's what I would say. That would be best. Yeah, yeah. And then I guess um, some of the implications of that sort of super metabolic load on the muscle would be that that DOMS, the muscle soreness. And that's something that I've always, I've personally always been confused by, is DOMS a reflection of a good workout? I, I, I was always under the impression, you know, if I'm not sore, I haven't trained hard enough sort of thing. Well, I, as, as far as I know, they have done studies on it. And I can tell you, you know, firsthand that there isn't a direct correlation. You can play tennis tomorrow and you'll be sore, but that doesn't mean your muscles are going to grow from it. If you haven't been playing tennis for a long time, you're going to get sore from it because it's, there's a novelty effect, yeah. right? You're going to get sore from novelty. Anytime you cross over into a new area that the muscle's not familiar with, you can get sore from isometric. You could just hold uh, and hold this for two minutes and you're going to have, you know, sore pecs tomorrow, but you know, that's not going to cause your pecs to grow, mm. right? Conversely, you can train your muscles consistently. And after a while, that novelty kind of wears off and pretty soon you say, well, I'm not getting sore anymore. But yet if you were to continue and you took, let's say photos or had some other way of measuring, you would see the muscle still does grow. So they are not that linked that you can't get one without the other. Mm, awesome. Awesome. Doug, I'd love to, um, do you want to share with my listeners and explain just the very basics of the rotator cuffs um, and, and why it's sure. common shoulder injury. People are saying, oh, you should protect or, you know, support your rotator cuffs. Like what can people do to actually protect them? Well, the, the first thing that has to be acknowledged is that even though it sounds like a singular thing, the rotator cuff, it's actually four muscles. Okay, and one of the four is the supraspinatus, which is we have a muscle that goes across underneath our trapezius that's called the supraspinatus, and the supraspinatus tendon is the thing that creeps out from underneath the acromion process, wraps around the top of the humeral head, and its primary job is to hold the humeral head in socket. Right. It also contributes to the first five to ten degrees of the range of motion of a side raise. Oh. beyond five to 10 degrees, it's mostly side delta that does the work, but it's participating. It's not doing it exclusively, but if you look it up in the book, you'll say, you know, it keeps the, the, the humeral head in socket and contributes 
to the early part of a side raise. Okay, so that's one of your four rotator cuff muscles. Then you have your infraspinatus, which is your primary external rotator. If you look it up, you'll see it's, it's, it lies flush on your scapula. Its origin is on the inside edge of the scapula, and then these fibers run out, and they wrap, they go across the shoulder joint, they wrap around the humeral head. So when that muscle contracts, it, it rotates, it rotates the upper arm back. The subscapularis is on the front part of the shoulder blade. It wraps around the other direction, so it pulls inward. You also have a teres minor and a teres major. They are the lesser contributors to internal external rotation. So when someone says, I tore my rotator cuff, th which one? Did you, did you injure your infraspinatus or did you injure your supraspinatus, right? So if you, have a, if you have impingement syndrome, which is that thing we talked about earlier, you have a rotator cuff injury, but maybe your infraspinatus is fine. Right. And your subscript. So, so that's one thing is to understand that it isn't one thing. Number one. Number two is once you understand like what we just described, which is the overhead press, you realize that a lot of things that we think are just normal, everyday traditional exercises could in fact be straining the infraspinatus. I'll give you another example. Let's just say, and, and look out for this too. Let's say you're in the gym and you see someone over there doing a flat dumbbell press. Okay, same thing. They're on their back. And instead of their forearm being vertical, they're actually pushing toward their feet. It's a small amount, right? And it's, it's no big deal if the weight you're doing this flat dumbbell press on is relatively light. But when you start getting into a heavier and heavier weight, that forward lean wants to keep going. And now you're straining your infraspinatus and you're straining it with a weight that is more intended for the strength of the pectoral muscles, which is much stronger, right? So the infraspinatus is commonly injured. In fact, if you go up to someone who says, I've got shoulder pain and you take your thumb and you put it right on the surface of their shoulder blade and you go like this, they go, ah, well, that's usually what's irritated is the infraspinatus. Mm. So, and then you'll see someone who's taking a pair of dumbbells and they're doing this. Right, which and, and they're doing you say, What are you doing that for? You say, I'm doing that for my rotator cuff. And I say, Well, you realize that the dumbbell you're holding in your hand is not moving opposite your movement. Right? It goes, it wants to go down, or you're you're moving horizontally. So you're not actually working either the internal or the external muscle. And if you were working one of those, you can only work one of them at a time. Mm. Right? Just like you can't work your bicep and your tricep at the same time. Right, because you can only use one resistance at a time, and one resistance has one direction of resistance. Right, so if you're holding a pair of dumbbells, right, you're going to load your bicep. In order to load your tricep, you have to have something pulling the other direction, which would be up. Right, tricep push down. So you can't work. You have to choose one or the other. First, you do the external with an internal force, right, and then you do the internal movement with an external force. Right, it's fascinating. But 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 the thing is, there's so many, so many extra, I mean, even an upright row is going to load that rotator. Mm. So that's why it's really important to understand the things I teach in my book are alignment. For example, once, once something moves out of alignment, it's loading something else entirely. Mm. And if that's not your intention, and it usually isn't, um, you're going to have a problem. <laughs> yeah. It's predictable. I mean, you know, you can... You can almost take a survey in the gym and ask people if they have shoulder pain, and they almost all do. Yeah. Because traditional exercises are oftentimes very stressful to the infraspinatus and the supraspinatus. You know what's funny, Doug, is that that principle of the um, reciprocal inhibition where only one muscle – but when, when bodybuilders, obviously, when they're on stage and they're flexing, they can flex their – when they tense their muscle group, they're able well, this is, it's a good question. It's a good question. Okay, so let's just say I'm going to flex my bicep. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go like this. And you're going to say, well, your tricep is flexed. I would say, well, my bicep is hard. But my tricep actually isn't. Mm. And if you said, well, go ahead and flex your tricep, I have to straighten my arm to do it. Oh. Right? So even though you think you're flexing both by doing this, you're not. You're shortening. 
the tricep, the bicep. And in order for that to occur, the body has to shut off the tricep. Now, let's just say you tell someone um, to come up to you and, and, and give you some, some, some force here, and you're going to push out against his hand. As soon as you do that, your triceps are going to go soft. The bicep goes soft, yeah. I'm sorry, the bicep goes soft because now you're activating the tricep by pushing outward against his hand. Okay, so if I do this and I push out outward, now my tricep is going to go. So here's another big, an example. Let's just say that you're going to look at my arm right here. And I'm going to say, okay, my bicep is not holding a weight. It's not super hard. There's a certain amount of softness to it. I'm going to, and I'm now going to push down against my leg. Ah, oh, interesting. <laughs> so, so even though you see a bodybuilder on stage and they're tensing, it may look like their tricep is flexed because you're seeing definition, but they're super lean. You're going to see definition on anything, right? The question is which muscle is actually, and by the way, there's a difference between tensing a muscle and loading a muscle. Yes. Right? So when you load a muscle, the central nervous system says, well, I can't let that muscle be loaded. And at the same time, allow the, the opposite muscle, the opposing muscle, to, 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 to work against it. Mm. I can't allow it. Mm. It's, it's just fascinating. Yeah. But that, it just reminds me, I, I did a little bit of study, exercise science, all that sort of, those terminologies, the way you describe them, rotator cuff, all comes, it's all coming back to me. It's like, there in the dis distant part of my brain in the cobwebs, but now all this talk around is is reviving that, and just it really excites me. And that's I knew this was going to be a, a phenomenal. You, you know what's interesting is is um, I I was um, I'm I'm doing a project right now. I'm putting together a team of health experts, uh, and so I'm covering all the bases, right? So I've got an exercise physiologist for the cardiovascular stuff. I've got a mental health couple of mental health PhDs. I've got a sleep specialist. I've got, you know, uh, biomedical nutrition specialist. So I'm putting together this team. And in the process of looking for these people, I would do these Google searches and I would find basically the faculty of these universities. And what I would find is whenever you look for exercise science, I actually screenshotted it. I can actually send it to you. So it's, so it's a, you can see the graphic. There was like five pictures of exercise science. And none of them involved biomechanics. Mm. It was, you know, CO2 max, oxygen utilization. It was, uh, you know, they had a couple of girls with a couple of dumbbells doing like aerobic classes with dumbbells. Well, that's not, that's not loading a muscle, right? So, and as I said, in, in speaking with some of these other PhDs that I've worked with and also have endorsed my book, they've said it is fascinating that biomechanics has been so neglected. It's really been absent in exercise science. Mm, yeah, I, I do want to. I do want to slowly um, finish up the episode, Doug, and I, I do want to give my listeners a chance to connect with you closely and also um, check out all of your amazing resources, your books, and things like that. So, where can they do that, Doug? Okay, uh, my email is dbfitness at aol .com. Um, I'm at dougbrignoli.com website. Uh, and our courses, our videos, my associate Mo Larby does a great job with me. He's, you know, I, I'm a nerd. <laughs> and so I don't like marketing. I don't like products. I don't like tech. I just like reading and learning and teaching. Um, and so he, he helps me with all that. So uh, you can contact Mo Larby at Smart Training 365 or Smart Training 365 at gmail.com. Um, and I, as you can imagine, I get a lot of questions and I cannot answer them all. I mean, I can't even read all the questions. And the problem is that some of these answers require lengthy explanations and oftentimes visuals. So it's completely unrealistic that I would spend 20 or 30 minutes answering one person's question um, when I get, you know, 30 or 40 of these things in a day. And then as soon as I answer one question, the person thinks, oh, good, he answers questions. Here's a second one. Here's the third one. And of course, the questions are endless, as they should be, right? Because there's a lot to know. I apologize if I can't answer your question, but you can also send your questions to Molarby at Smart Training 365. And he can he usually selects the questions to ask me during our weekly videotapings. Cool. Awesome. Awesome, Doug. 
Well, um, yeah, I mean, today was absolutely awesome. I know my listeners are going to find this really entertaining and also learning so much as well because we haven't had anyone sort of talk about anything related to biomechanics on the podcast. Um, and I'm just expanding that breadth of guests and, you know, I'm so happy to have you on the show. And Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Yeah, we might even uh, have to organize another another episode in the, in the future. I'd but- love it. I'd love it. Awesome, Doug. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Uh, Be sure to check out all the links down below. Um, Thank you, Doug. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.